Um, this evening's conversation is entitled Sacred Media, Religious Experience in Beauty in Art. My name is Angela O'Donnell, and I'm the Associate and Acting Director of the Francis and Ann Curran Center for American Catholic Studies. We at the Center are delighted to sponsor this evening's presentation, which is part of a series of programs devoted to the Catholic imagination. Conversations aimed at opening the discussion of what it means to be Catholic beyond the typical theological and historical definitions of that experience. Catholic culture, as we are all well aware, places enormous emphasis upon the incarnational experience of faith. Our liturgical life is filled with the concrete practice of the sacraments, which feature concrete materials, water, chrism, incense, bread, and wine, to name just a few. Included, albeit unofficially, among those sacraments is the making of art, wherein a human being uses ordinary materials, granite, marble, wood, paint, ink, and paper, among others, to fashion a piece of work that gestures toward the infinite, that testifies to the presence of the divine in ordinary matter, and that brings us into communion with beauty. There's long precedence for this linking of the beautiful and the divine, or to use more academic terminology, the academic, or rather the aesthetic and the theological, most of us are no doubt familiar with the powerful words of St. Augustine, that great saint and poet, who wrote these lines of verse in his famous confessions. Late have I loved you, beauty, both old and new. Late have I loved you. Augustine finds his yearning for God and his love of the beautiful as one in the same. He is not alone in this. Many of the finest and most celebrated artists have confessed to the same commingling of desires, among them Francesco, Michelangelo, and Dante. The urge for beauty is among the deepest of human impulses, and artists find ways to address this yearning, both that appeal to both our senses and our soul. Art enables us to live the abundant life, and the making and sharing of art enables us to give that life away to others. Tonight's conversation promises to engage these issues in varied and specific ways. Each of our four distinguished panelists, I'm sorry, uh, each of our four distinguished panelists, Dominic Colonna, Mary Ellen Collette, Catherine Osborne, and Richard Valetisau, has thought deeply and written expertly about the nexus of theology and art and approaches the topic from a unique perspective. Tonight's panel moderator, and indeed the organizing force behind this evening's enterprise, is Dr. Dominic Colonna, who comes to us from Lewis University in Romeoville, Illinois, where he is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Theology. Professor Colonna, as many of you are aware, is no stranger to Fordham. He earned his PhD in 1998 in Systematic Theology here in our own theology department. His current area of research is theological aesthetics, the focus of which is an examination of how theological doctrines can be effectively communicated through the arts. His publications include a number of articles relating to this topic, including An Echo in the Soul, Grace and the Human Response, The Trinity and Salvation, which appears in a collection entitled Sacred Adventure, Beginning Theological Study, and The Trinity in New Mexican Folk Art, which appeared in a journal listening Journal of Religion and Culture in 2002. Also of interest, uh, in 2007, Professor Colonna convened a symposium along with colleagues from Lewis University entitled God in the Material World, Roman Catholic Material Culture, which included public talks, faculty colloquia, art exhibits, and a musical performance. Sounds like a wonderful conference and seems in some ways to be a large-scale version of the panel discussion that we're enjoying this evening. We're very glad that Professor Colonna has decided to bring a version of this program here, home, to Fordham, uh, and to share it with us. So please join me in welcoming Dominic Colonna along with his panelists. Thank you very much, Angela, for that really wonderful contextualizing of what we'll do today. 
Um, um, in some ways, she's already finished my talk, so I'm going home. By um, wonderful way to, to talk about art and its place in, in the Catholic world. Um, briefly, I want to introduce my other uh, co-panelists and give you a little bit of an understanding of how we hope to proceed. Um, we want to offer four brief um, comments about um, our particular theses, our opinions about the relationship between faith and art. The title of the, 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 the program today, Sacred Media, Religious Experience and Beauty in Art, allows us to talk about our encounters with the beautiful and how it might draw our minds to God. Um, first off, I've already been introduced, so it's really my task to introduce my co-panelist, Richard Vladisau, really um, a prominent person in this field. His um, major text, Theological Aesthetics, God and Imagination, Beauty and Art, is a, is a very foundational work in the area of theological aesthetics. He's written other texts as well, but his most recent is The Triumph of the Cross, The Passion of Christ and Theology in the Arts from the Renaissance to the Counter-Reformation. Uh, Father Vladisau is a professor of theology here at Fordham. He, um, he was my mentor, and oddly, we did not ever talk about faith and art when we were here together. Um, secondly, Catherine Osborne. Um, she'll be giving a talk called Theological Aesthetics in an Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Catherine is a doctoral student in theology here at Fordham, specializing in American Catholic studies. Her research is on Catholics and modern art in, in the decades prior to Vatican II. Her essay, Visual Literacy and Catholic Studies, will appear in a forthcoming volume on Catholic Studies from Fordham University Press. Finally, a colleague who I dragged along from Lewis University, someone who was very helpful in planning that symposium that um, Angela referred to, Mary Ellen Davis Collette. She'll be giving a talk or at least talking about um, briefly, um, the topic is the morphing Madonna, apparitional aesthetics in Catholic devotional media. Mary Ellen is an assistant professor in the Department of Theology, helping me to develop a program in Catholic studies. Her publications include Mary as Media Icon, Gender and Militancy in 20th Century U.S. Roman Catholic Devotional Media in Lynn Schofield Clark's um, book, Religion, Media, and the Marketplace. Um, she's also got a publication where she talks about the space of Lewis University as a, as a sacred space, entitled Lewis University as Sacred Space. So um, we'll have um, several 15-minute presentations, and we're going to invite you all to respond to us. You have homework. You have to pay attention. And um, maybe ask a few questions when we're done. We'll sit here so we can see any of the images that are shown, but then we'll come sit up here afterwards. So we've chosen uh, Father Richard to start us off. Good evening, thank you for coming. Uh, at this dinner hour in particular, uh, to hear these little talks. As um, both Angela and Dominic said, we're talking about a variety of things, and my task is to talk most specifically about art uh, and how it mediates the sacred among the various different media that we'll be discussing. I'd like to talk, first of all, briefly on the question how does sacred art work? How does sacred art function? And I'll illustrate this with just a um, very, very quick series of pictures, uh, and then um, in the second part, dwell a little bit more on uh, what we'll be seeing. Ever since the time of Gregory the Great, in the West, the primary function of the arts, of sacred art, has been to present the scriptures to the illiterate or to present the scriptures more effectively to the literate. Uh, art was seen as essentially the, the Bible presented visually. And there are a number of different ways in which it accomplished that. 
Art could be simply a, a symbolic way of writing. Um, an example, the, the fish and the bread in the catacombs, a symbolic way of writing Eucharist and the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Art was also used frequently specifically as narration, actually presenting biblical scenes. Here we have the creation of Eve in this uh, beautiful sculpture from the Cathedral at Orvieto. Okay, similarly, within the, within the narrative genre uh, is the use of allegories, the presentation of abstract ideas by means of pictures. So here we have the, the allegory of charity, uh, La Carita, um, by, uh, uh, by Lione. The arts could also be used uh, as specific illustrations of texts. I'm going to hold. Uh, so here we have an illustration of the gospel text of the Eucharist from the Rosano Gospels. And in the Counter-Reformation, the, the development of what was sometimes called the Jesuit style of illustration, in which you not only have a picture showing what's happening, but actually labels in the picture specifically associating every element in the picture with a text. In the Counter-Reformation desire to emphasize the scriptures themselves. One could also use art in a more iconic way as a means of trying to create a sense of presence. This of course was much more frequently used in the Eastern churches, and the Eastern churches have a much more explicit theology of the icon as a quasi-sacramental means of uh, coming into the presence of God. But we find it implicitly in a lot of art also in the West. It's a means of coming into the presence of what is being uh, presented. And of course, a great deal of art intended to be simply decoration. I shouldn't say simply decoration, decoration in the etymological sense of the word, making something decorus from the, the Latin word deke, uh, it is fitting, making something fitting for God, fitting for the worship of God. And it's interesting, of course, that it's taken for granted that what's fitting for the worship of God is what's beautiful, what's rich, what's comely. Even though we also find in the West a series of protests against that association of the beautiful with the religious um, in people from Bernard of Clairvaux all the way up to Tolstoy. Uh, and I think that uh, Mary Ellen in her talk will probably advert to the fact that sometimes religious art uh, specifically chooses the non-beautiful. The main theme that I'd like to spend some time in is the question, how does non-sacred art mediate the holy or the experience of the sacred, non-religious art? As Angela said at the beginning, the, the Roman Catholic tradition in particular has always had a kind of openness to the world. Uh, in the Middle Ages, in the Renaissance, the church was one of the great patrons of the arts. And so it's fitting to look at this larger question of how art in general mediates or can mediate uh, the meaning of the sacred. Now, first of all, it has to be noted that the, this division between sacred and secular is not always as clear, not always as clear cut as it might seem. Uh, in the history of art, a great many works that the modern viewer instinctively sees as being secular works, were at least partially religious in their purpose. They often refer to the sacred by their symbolism and by their reference, either overt or hidden. The most familiar form of that is the, the Renaissance use of pagan myths as allegories for Christian doctrine but also a great many secular Dutch still lives and genre paintings are in fact didactic religious works in which the allusion to the sacred is contained within 
a secular setting. The symbolism is largely lost to us so that generally when you see them in museums, they don't function as sacred paintings. Although they might evoke a religious reaction for quite a different reason. A good example of this is this uh, painting by Jan Bruegel and Peter Paul Rubens, which is an allegory, the allegory of sight. And if you look at it, it has mythological figures in it. It has all kinds of visible objects. Uh, it has um, uh, all kinds of references and allusions to sight and various visible things and paintings and light itself and landscape. But the key to the painting that most people would not see at all is the painting within the painting that the figure of Visio is looking at and that's being held by this little puto or a cupid. And the painting here that she's looking at is a painting of Christ giving sight to the blind man. And that's the key to the entire allegory of sight. God as light, vision as a spiritual reality, as coming from the encounter with God. We see many similar allegories of this kind. This is uh, Joachim Buchala's uh, painting of the element water from his series On the Elements. And again, it's seemingly a completely secular genre work. Unless you happen to notice that through this arch, there's a picture of Christ calling the apostles who were fishermen. And this is the key to the allegory of water with its references to baptism, its references to discipleship, and art scholars have noticed that if you count the fish here, there are 12 different species of fish, 12 apostles. In a sense, more fascinating, however, is um, genuine secular art. And here I'm conversing with a book by Timothy Garin from Exeter University, a book that he calls Secular Parables, which is about exactly this topic. Uh, the book has not yet been published. It will be published this coming year by Yale University Press. Garin talks about secular art as parables not in the, the strict scriptural sense, but in the sense that they provoke us to think. And he advances the thesis um, grounded historically in the Calvinist Reformation that the process of secularization need not be inimical to Christianity, but may instead open it up to a different dimension of God's presence and revelation found precisely in the secular world. And he makes a contention which was um, previously made by, in the early 20th century by the Calvinist theologian Abraham Kuyper that Calvinism in fact freed religion from art and freed art from religion, allowing each to reveal God in its independent way. Now, Garand says we can see this happening in three distinct ways. Art can, first of all, serve as a prophecy. It can envisage an alternative future. Or it can serve as a critique of the world as it actually is, by showing what Skilibex calls a contrast experience. The imperfection and the evil in the world call out for reversal. So the cry of the poor and the lamentation of the world is an implied protest against it, and at least for the Christian, implies an eschatological vision of the possibility of reversing it. So an example of Picasso's famous painting of the bombing of Guernica, or Goya's painting uh, in Tres de Mayo, showing the execution of uh, Spanish partisans by Napoleon's troops. A second way in which secular art can serve as a parable, Garin says, is by creating aesthetic delight. First of all, by looking at the possibility of moral beauty 
Now here these are out of order, so I'm going to have to find the, uh, the correct painting. Here it is, okay. Um, Jacques-Louis David's Death of Socrates. This kind of painting through the 17th and 18th century was considered the supreme form of painting. Painting that showed moral beauty, that showed heroism that was to be imitated. Obviously, this also intends to show a certain degree of physical beauty. And in both of these, they are, uh, according to Garange, a kind of uh, anticipation, a parable of the coming kingdom of God. And finally, painting can serve as a way of teaching us to see things differently, to confront us with a different ontological reality. This is the very, very famous painting of persimmons by the uh, Chinese Buddhist Zen monk, Mu Qi. It's, in a sense, a completely secular painting as far as its um, subject goes. It's just five persimmons. But it's also a Zen painting, and in that sense, it's a secular religious painting. It's intended to surprise us. Where are these persimmons? Are they sitting on something? Are they floating in space? Are these persimmons above this one? Are they behind it, according to our normal view of perspective? It's meant to confuse us, like a Zen koan. And it's meant to confront us, not only with a picture of persimmons, but it's meant to get us to think, here's me looking at a picture of persimmons. It's meant to confront us with our own existence, as well as the existence of what's outside of ourselves. Um, and therefore provoke us, not only of the independent being of something other, but also to reflect on our own consciousness of it, and our own seeing of it. Finally, I want to suggest very, very briefly, and maybe some of this will come up in the discussion periods, that there's an educative value to art. The experience and the appreciation of one kind of beauty can lead to the appreciation of other kinds of beauty, at least ideally. And I think there are three points of relevance that one could point out here. There's a relevance of all of this to ecological concerns. The idea of beauty explicates and names a motivation for loving things for themselves, even though they're of no use for us. That connects with Kant's definition of beauty, something that's uh, seen as, as though it were an end, even though it has no use, no purpose. And it seems to me that this is a, a category that ecological theology would be well to look at as mediating why we can love the world for itself, even while using it. Secondly, all of this raises the question of taste. Art in particular raises the question of taste. At a certain point, we confer beauty. We decide what, what's going to be beautiful. And I think Dr. Colonna will be speaking to a certain extent about that. We can make something beautiful to a certain extent by our choices. And that includes also our moral choices. There is such a thing as beautiful act as well as beautiful art. And we can educate our taste in the direction of heroism, of justice, of goodness. And finally, all of this I think is very, very relevant to, the, um, to one of the main points of Ignatian spirituality, of a kind of mysticism in the world. If we can love beauty in art, can't we extend that to other things, to ordinary things that are not usually objects of art, although they might be, and Catherine's talk, I think, will address some of this point. Can we recognize a kind of analogy of beauty so that ultimately, in one way or another, everything is beautiful, everything is lovable, everything is good? And there I must end, and I hope that some of these questions will come up again later on. <laughs>
everybody. Um, it's nice to be here with old friends and new friends. Um, what I want to talk about today is, um, uh, my experience with teaching faith and the arts. Um, in some ways it's really the kinds of, uh, difficulties that I've had in trying to, um, use some of the ideas that Father Vladislav has, has offered in, in one of his books, Theology and the Arts. I love to listen to him talk about things and show illusions and show, um, to decipher meanings. But when I'm sitting in front of a classroom filled, filled with 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds, they say, well, that's all well and good, but I don't see that. I couldn't even see that picture of Jesus in the, um, in the smaller picture or in either of the two. And so I, I found that I've had to develop um, procedures and criteria by which I could evaluate their work and then ways to communicate to them um, by which they can understand what they're seeing. Because in a way what we're doing is, is learning to read a new book, a different kind of book, um, a text that, that is, is gripping and, and is exciting, um, but it's difficult to read because they're unaccustomed to it. And then, um, let's see if I can scroll through here. In a way, my thesis or my goals is to, uh, goal is to, is to get to this point here. So I want to go before, we won't look at all these, oh my gosh. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? I missed it. Where is the... And this is where I ended up after um, several years of trying to pull together a method by which the students could understand or could read the text. And what I did was I really combined um, methods or procedures um, in art history for analyzing a piece of artwork. But I found that um, an important thing to do was to take procedures in moral theology and, um, and apply them because um, what's done in both of these procedures is this. It recognizes as perhaps um, a great goal, the goal in coming to appreciate what we experience is the ability to evaluate that which we see. Not just memorize it or summarize it. Um, if you're um, experienced with teaching students, sometimes the students find it very easy to tell you what the text said, but they can't really readily tell you what the text means to them. Um, and I thought there was an affinity between moral decision making and moral evaluation and aesthetic evaluation. Both involved the process of taking something that they thought was personally valuable and then taking objective information, things that they saw and then tried to do something with it. So um, essentially what I was looking to develop were processes and criteria used in moral decision making um, so that I could apply them to aesthetic judgments. And what I found is that, that as with moral judgments, one ended up um, um, making moral or having moral consequences when they made aesthetic judgments as well. And I'll try to illustrate that in a moment here. Um, just to briefly review, in bold I have here that there's an initial appraisal, there's an initial confrontation, or confrontation I sound like um, so negative, um, an experience of the art. And um, Father Vladislav was talking about this phenomenon. Is it religious art? This is the first question, it's our mantra through the class. I show an image a class. We spend about an hour on each image. Is it Christian art? Is it good Christian art? And they say, how do I know? I don't know. So um, what we need to do is develop um, an analysis that follows art appreciation techniques, but also includes theological elements. So the formal analysis will look at the medium and the art elements, for example but we'll also use theological ideas to interpret the text. And very important to that is to recognize, I mentioned here, third line down, personal and communal meanings. They're allowed to tell me what they think, but they can't, they can't be irresponsible in telling me what they think. They have to come to recognize the consequences and the implications for what they might like or not like. And that gets on very touchy ground sometimes. But I think it's, an, it's, an, it's something that has to be done in, in, in my regular theology classes as well. The final step in the process is to evaluate um, that which they experience. 
and to come to an understanding of what their criteria are for evaluating the art. Many people, especially in the classes that I've experienced, will spend no more than 30 seconds looking at something if they walk by it in a museum. After an hour of analysis, and this is true in any study, I think, they will come to a better understanding. Frank Birch Brown, who wrote a book, Good Taste, Bad Taste, Christian Taste, suggested that if you develop a discriminating taste, that you become better able to appreciate difference in your world. Let's see if I can go up to... Typically, what I would do is take an image like this, and I would ask them, is this Christian religious art? Is this good Christian religious art? And initially, the reaction would be, well, I spoke to my brother-in-law last night, my sister's here today, and he turned up his nose and crinkled his nose and said, there's something wrong. This is not Christian religious art. Can you see what this is? It's a photo collage, a classical image of Jesus, but he has a tourniquet on his arm so that he can find a vein so that he can take a drug intravenously. I don't know, is anybody familiar with this piece? It's by, let's see if I can get this to work. David Wojnarowicz. See, I have to put the spelling there, the phonetic spelling, pronunciation there. And it's not a very popular piece. It's not as popular as some of the more radical, challenging pieces. But this I found on a website dealing with legal studies because he was sued. He was a person who was, I think, taking federal funds, and it was found to be offensive to some members of the community. But using the kind of criteria that I was trying to use in class, giving students a chance to look at this, the idea is that they can come to recognize, well, one author who had looked at this piece suggested, this is Sue Taylor, a new Catholic iconography. He was vehement in his attacks on what he perceived as the hypocrisy of the church in the face of AIDS. Still cherished the idea of a merciful Jesus. In this particular piece, he doesn't attempt to blaspheme, he asserted, but to conjure a savior who would take on the suffering and sins of the world, even those of drug addicts. In a way, my thesis is very simple. If you pay attention, if you look a little closely, if you try to understand the context, something that I think, my first assessment is this is not visually very, very appealing. But like the concept of a contrast experience that Father Vladislav referred to, when we become aware of an image, and we become aware through the image of perhaps the injustices in life, or perhaps of an awareness of suffering in the world, we come to a different understanding. The appropriation of a Christian symbol, for some, is very offensive. I think of Andre Serrano's Piss Christ, a very famous piece, where he submerged a plastic crucifix in a vat of urine. A very offensive kind of object. I don't know the background here, if it's the same for the Serrano, but here the claim is that he's trying to incorporate or co-opt a Christian symbol to make a message about his understanding of the saving grace of Jesus. I had an image here. Let's see if I kept it. No. I can find it. This one. A more traditional following in that, that sort of rooted in a Renaissance style, although a later piece from the 18th century. And I just wanted to point out that in making aesthetic judgments, we make judgments and oftentimes we don't see the consequences, the moral consequences for them. This is an image of the Trinity, and by the 20th century, it actually is formally forbidden. I don't know if it's still forbidden. Are you familiar with that? In the 20th century, the church, when I tell people this, they sort of chuckle and say, why? What's the big deal? Now, as a theologian, we can think of all kinds of moral, well, all kinds of theological consequences. But what I want to suggest is that an image like this, if you dig deep enough, 
and you might say this about any piece of artwork, um, really could have as many moral consequences it could be related to sexist kind of tendencies, um, the particular community's desire to represent the Godhead um, in the same way. The first time I saw an image like this, I was shocked because it, it was from a Hispanic community and it seemed to be somewhat narcissistic, if you can use that term for a community, concerned only about representing God as, um, as a, a, a young Hispanic man. Here we can see the contrast. Here there's moral, there's moral import, consequences and implications. Um, I think if we dig deeper and use these criteria, we can sort of see that even images like this can have those kinds of consequences. That's all that I wanted to say. So thanks very much. to thank you also all for being here tonight and thanks especially to the Curran Center for inviting and hosting our panel. And we are, I think, about to have a transition in the panel and that I think that Catherine and I are shifting more from the previous conversation about beauty and morality in art to a conversation about meaning and uh, the relationship between meaning and the uses of art, especially in devotional contexts. So some of the images I'll be showing are also from the fine arts tradition and, and particularly by contemporary American artists. But we will also be looking at some mass-produced images and that is something that's very much the subject of Catherine's presentation. And so in thinking about this question, first as a research problem, I was struck by the fact that the Virgin Mary is, of course, represented in the Catholic tradition in diverse ways. And if we think about the consistency of her image and the concept of the Virgin Mary, uh, that's pretty amazing when you think about the, the numerous incarnations and guises that she's taken on through art in the Western Christian tradition. And so the central question is, how does Mary, how do representations of Mary remain stable and consistent even despite this great variety and diversity of representations? A second smaller question has to do with examining the tie between representations of Marian apparitions in particular and exploring that type of diversity. Um, from a devotional perspective, from a Marianist perspective within the Catholic tradition, um, Mary has appeared throughout history and in various uh, times and places and has taken on a persona that's connected to the culture and context of that particular apparition event. And so I got to thinking about the aesthetic of apparitions. Could there be something that we might call an apparitional aesthetics going on in the production and use of those sorts of images. And in thinking about the uses of such images, I propose that there are three stages of representation that take place, typically in the evolution of devotion around a particular Marian apparition event. And First of all, we have the visual dimension, the visual encounter of the apparition event itself, in which the tradition argues that a saint, uh, for example, if we take the example of Lourdes, Saint Bernadette, had a face-to-face -face encounter with the Virgin Mary in the person of, in the guise of the Immaculate Conception, and later uh, described as Our Lady of Lourdes. So we have an initial visual encounter, and then a second a uh, movement which represents our first stage of representation is the actual construction of a shrine at an apparition site that literally uses physical markers to commemorate the event of the apparition and creates a sacred space, a boundary around that event and has uh, productive symbols and representations that go along with the construction of that shrine. A second stage has to do with then moving out from the shrine that's tied to a physical place, 
to a commemorative devotional image, and this is something that typically shows up in a holy card that might represent or recall the apparition event, and we're going to be looking at some holy card images. And those are used in a wide variety of devotional purposes, um, that someone, a devotee, might be attracted to a particular apparition site or apparition story as a way of serving some spiritual need um, that's come up in their lives. Okay, so they may have a home shrine or a home altar in which that image figures predominantly, or they may have a special uh, way of praying the rosary, for example, that's connected to that particular uh, apparitional site. And so this is an, a new layer of representation. And then the third stage of representation I'll be talking about is the appropriation of those initial ideas of an apparitional aesthetic for new messages and new purposes. And we're going to be looking at some contemporary American artists who take traditional images of the Madonna and use them in some very new and surprising ways while still expressing a spiritual idea. So I wanted to first look at simply a photograph here of the Grotto Shrine um, at Lourdes, France. Uh, the apparition, the main apparition event there uh, was, took place in 1854. And again, it was appearance of the Virgin in the guise of the Immaculate Conception uh, to St. Bernadette, a peasant girl, uh, who was later on made a saint by the Catholic Church. And here we have simply some of the physical markers of this as a sacred space. And actually, if you're interested, if you go online and look at the website for the Lourdes Shrine in France, um, they actually have numerous images, but also some webcams uh, that are on 24 hours a day. You can uh, log into the site and view uh, masses. You can view the pilgrims as they come and go from various parts of the shrine. And the main camera is centered on this grotto space. What is interesting about this to me is, is not just the construction of a historical site, uh, but the opening up of the shrine to the possibility of new spiritual experiences and, and encounters. And I think part of this, rep representationally speaking, comes from a feeling that sites where holy events have taken place, that there might be some sort of residue left in that place. There might be some sort of connection to past holiness. And we know the tradition of, of seeking healing that's grown up around the apparition site of words is very much based on that devotional logic, that if I can go and touch this place, if I can drink of the water of the Holy Spring, then somehow I might em embrace that same sort of transformational experience that happened at the original apparition. So the question for pilgrims is, is what remains here? When we create a shrine and when we photograph it and document it, what traces of the holy can we seek there? And in marking this shift from its emphasis on uh, pursuit of beauty and the, the hidden messages of morality that might be in theological art, I'm really going for a more philosophical approach about the dynamics of representations. And here I have a famous quote from philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who argued that meaning is use. And of course, in his work, he was talking uh, primarily about language and words and how words uh, function relationally to each other, that the relationships between words and the relationships we construct through speech uh, provide the words themselves their meaning, that meaning is always in context. And so it was important to me to think about how that might be happening as well at the visual language of signs, okay, looking particularly to religious representations. And being a good uh, student of Catholic studies and also someone trained in contemporary critical theory, the connection was obvious to me to think about some of the contemporary theories of representation, and particularly how postmodern theorists have played around with the ideas of representation and signs and their relationships, 
I'm very much, I think, trying to shake up or uh, question or undermine the stable types of relationships that we assume uh, exist between signs, be they linguistic or visual. And I just wanted to pause here on a quote from Jean Baudrillard, one of the um, early postmodern theorists who focused on the idea of image and its relationship to meaning. He argued that all Western faith and good faith became engaged in this wager on representation, that a sign could refer to the depth of meaning, that a sign could be exchanged for meaning, and that something could guarantee this exchange. God, of course. But what if God himself can be simulated, that is to say, can be reduced to the signs that constitute faith? Then the whole system becomes weightless. It is no longer itself any more but a gigantic simulacrum, not unreal but a simulacrum. That is to say, never exchanged for the real, but exchanged for itself in an uninterrupted circuit without reference or circumference. If we think about that for a minute, he's suggesting that in a um, pre-modern, we might say, understanding of a representation, the idea was that there was a, a guarantee on the meaning of something, that, that God stood behind image, and that gave a certainty or a, a surety to the meaning and relationship of representations. He's saying that in today's postmodern world that these signs have become unhinged from their original meanings, and we have instead image as a simulation, this uh, simulacra, that really bears no necessary, necessary relationship to the original idea or concept or personage or image that it represented. And I really, I think this is fascinating and, and very interesting and provocative, but in examining the devotional practices of Marian devotees and the way that they use images, I would really challenge um, some of Baudrillard's assumptions here. And I wanted to look to some examples of that second stage of representation in apparitional aesthetics that I was mentioning earlier. Um, here we have a move toward images that commemorate a particular apparitional event. Okay, so on your left, we have a traditional holy card image of the apparition at Fatima in 1917, where Mary is said to have appeared to three uh, peasant children in the countryside and given to them a series of messages of some relevance and importance to the world of uh, that time. And this is by an unknown artist and almost, I think, in our eyes as a viewer, might look cartoonish and might not be uh, the same type of art that we would expect to be say, see hanging in a museum, um, but it's something that became mass-produced on holy cards, and you have several artists who imitate this type of representation. And there are a few just key symbolic elements that, for the informed viewer, uh, would reference, you would know that this represents Our Lady of Lourdes in that particular apparition. And so the way that the Virgin appears um, with the radiance of the sun, the way that she has the rosary draped across her, the way that her uh, hands are folded in prayer, and then the number and the gestures and the dress of the three children in front of her is, is signaling that particular apparitional moment. And like I was mentioning earlier, this card might be then taken and used for practices of personal devotion. Even though it might be mass-produced and on, on cheap paper, it might be something that's very significant in the prayer and spiritual life of an individual or a family. I want to contrast this with the image on your right, uh, which is from a 1950s pub publication called Immaculata. It was a magazine published by the Militia Immaculata, a, a very um, predominant devotional group to Mary in the 1950s. And this also, curiously enough, represents Our Lady of Fatima. Um, but here we have an instance of metonymy, where a particular image from the apparition experience was plucked out, this idea of the immaculate heart 
um, in a later apparition event in 1925, um, one of the children, Lucy, had a vision of the Madonna in which she exposed her immaculate heart to her and, and spoke about the need for uh, the conversion of Russia under the, the guise of her, under the watch of her immaculate heart, and that you should consecrate yourself to the suffering of this heart as a way to combat the, the rise in communism and the rise in uh, world global conflict. And this was a very common uh, application of the apparitions at Fatima was to put them into the anti-communist crusade. And so here we have a um, group who's using these images to commemorate the Madonna and to commemorate a particular apparition, but you're using a part of her to represent the whole and then applying that to a contemporary political purpose. I want to move on to the third stage of representation I was speaking about, which is the appropriation of images for new messages and new purposes. And so I started to allude to that with the Immaculate Heart image, but this is a, a further progression along those lines. So rather than just commemorating a particular apparitional representation of the Madonna, um, you then see images develop that use symbols, use uh, framing, use elements of apparitional aesthetics to then create new icons and new representations that are to communicate uh, spe specific ideas for a particular individual or group of people. Okay, and these are also from Immaculata Magazine. On your left, we have an image from 19, 1954 called Our Lady of the United States. And the image on the right is also called Our Lady of the United States, and that was on the cover of the magazine in 1960. On both of these images, we see elements and gestures and postures that for the informed viewer, again, if you knew this devotional history and you were familiar with many different apparition sites, some of these visual cues would jump out at you. Um, these are using those elements to create something new, okay, a new idea, Our Lady of the United States, again, very much linked to political and social ideas, a sense of, of legitimacy for American Catholic identity, um, that apparitions had occurred elsewhere in the world and that the United States needed to have its own Mary, its own image. Um, there was even a report around this time in Wisconsin of an apparition that became very controversial in the eyes of the church, uh, but was very uh, well publicized by this magazine. But here, particularly on the right, we have the Statue of Liberty uh, basically being presented or embraced by a classic Our Lady of Lourdes uh, Immaculate Conception image. And so this is a next level of appropriation, taking those aesthetics and applying them in new ways. Okay, and then to step it up Again, another level in the idea of appropriation, these are two representations by a contemporary American artists who have played around with the traditional image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a very ancient apparitional tradition. And on the left, as you face the screen, we have an image called Ironing Thinking by the artist J. Michael Walker. And this is uh, something that came out in 2005. And he actually has a whole series of images of Our Lady of Guadalupe at home, in a home setting, uh, doing the work of an everyday woman, an everyday woman at home, what are the daily chores one might engage in, and finding in this layer of representation a connection between an everyday experience and the sanctity of the Madonna, uh, referred to in traditional representations of the Guadalupe apparition. And so here we have the Madonna actually taking a break, taking some time out to remove her cloak and to iron it, to press it, so that it's going to look beautiful for her next uh, apparition or her next appearance. 
And then on the right, we have a very controversial image from 1999 by the digital artist Alma Lopez. Um, this is simply called Our Lady. And here we see uh, an image of Guadalupe. And again, we might ask ourselves, how do we know it's Guadalupe? There's elements here um, that are so familiar to Catholics who know that tradition. The way the woman is framed, uh, the crescent shape, the flowers, the roses. Uh, the colors even evoke a traditional uh, representation of Guadalupe, but what is in the middle is very not traditional, according to uh, Orthodox Catholic representations of Guadalupe. And this was um, on display in a museum exhibit of Latino Latina artists and became very controversial. Actually, um, the local archbishop spoke out against it. Um, the museum received a lot of complaints, and there was a question of whether the image should be taken down. And we want to think about what is so controversial about this. The artist herself uh, argued that this is not a blasphemous image. She wasn't doing this to take away from the sanctity of the Virgin, but rather she wanted to create a Virgin of Guadalupe that reflected her own experience as a Latina and the close relationship, the close identity between Latino women and the idea of Guadalupe, that Guadalupe was an ever-present image in their lives, and they wanted to see one that looked like her, and that reflected also perhaps a new feminism, a new Catholic Latina feminism that could be expressed through a, a managing of appropriation of traditional imagery. And just to begin to conclude here, I want to respond to a quote by Robert Orsi, who is a very well-known historian of American religion and, and American Catholic studies, who has this to say about <coughs> the traditional uh, diverse representations of the Madonna. And this is something I'm going to just read this for a second, and then I'm going to tell you why I might go in a different direction with this concept. Orsi says, it is impossible to tell a simple story about the Virgin Mary. She cannot be held in place by a single attribute, sorrow or delight, pur purity or compassion, or held accountable for a single social consequence, liberation or oppression, solidarity or fracture. She is not solely the creation of theologians or of the masses. She belongs completely neither to her devout nor to culture. She is always refracted through the prism of the needs and fears of the people who approach her. And so she is a protean and unstable figure. Because of this instability of meaning, Mary can be the occasion of serious cultural and psychological distress, which in turn provokes more determined efforts to fix her in place, but she continually frustrates these agendas. I detect no traces of frustration at efforts to fix Mary's image and meaning. These devotees do not question their rights to creatively adapt these representations of the Madonna to their own needs and purposes. This is perfectly acceptable. This idea of the morphing Madonna is both theologically and, and practically accepted and even embraced. The producers of Marian media do not appear troubled by the polysemic nature of Mary, nor do they claim exclusive rights to fix in her place. In fact, they exhibit a voracious appetite for a wide range of Marian representations, particularly the divergent guises taken on by the Madonna in worldwide apparitions. And this phenomenon, this is what prompted me to explore the apparitional aesthetics involved in devotional uses of images of the Madonna. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to everyone from the Curran Center for sponsoring this event, and especially to my fellow panelists for inviting me to be here, and to all of you for coming. Uh, the title of my talk, again, is, um, is Theological Aesthetics in an Age of Mechanical Reproduction, and uh, that is a reference to an essay by the great cultural critic Walter Benjamin, who um, has a, a, a classic essay called The Work of Art in an Age of Mechanical Reproduction, which if you have studied some art history, uh, you may have had an occasion to read. 
Um, in this essay, he, uh, Walter Benjamin pointed out that mechanical reproduction of works of art uh, represents something new in the aesthetic history of humankind. Before the printing press, before electricity, before especially photography and film, uh, that is before the mid-19th century, really, um, before all of this, a work of art could be copied only laboriously and by hand, uh, which kept even the copies that were made tied ultimately to the work of people, uh, not of machines. Uh, according to Benjamin, the artist's personal authority and the uniqueness of the object gives original handmade artworks what he called an aura of authenticity. Uh, this authenticity is what gives original artwork monetary and not incidentally spiritual and religious value. Benjamin argued that the advent of mechanical reproduction shattered this aura, which was predicated on the presence of the original artwork. The degradation of the aura through repeated reproduction destroyed art's function as a sacred object. And as an example of the kind of thing that he meant, um, if you've ever received a postcard from someone who's been traveling, uh, say a postcard of the interior of Chartres Cathedral or Hagia Sophia or anything else, um, you know, think about the difference between looking at a, a postcard like that and actually the, the sort of dizzying experience of actually finding yourself in one of these spaces. Uh, or the difference between looking at a projection on the screen tonight and actually, you know, being in a church or a museum looking at one of these works of art. It's, it's a totally different experience. In Benjamin's view, destroying the aura of authenticity detached art from its role as an enforcer of oppressive bourgeois religion, which he linked to fascism. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Benjamin's biography, uh, he was a German Jewish uh, Marxist who ultimately died while trying to escape from France in 1940. Um, the essay is from 1936. So he had some reasons for uh, speaking this way. Um, in less polemical terms, uh, we might extend his argument to say that what reproduction does to an image is to destroy the theological value of the classic work of art, which um, is its ability to participate in something that we would call revelation. Now, they don't refer to him very often, but theologians and other professional religious people, um, clergy, church employees, people writing in religious magazines like Common Real, seem to agree with Benjamin that there is something about mechanical reproduction that destroys the ability of art to communicate aspects of the sacred. Some of the most wide-ranging and influential work in the discipline of theological aesthetics hardly mentions actual works of art at all, concentrating instead on relatively abstract discussions of concepts like beauty. But when a systematic theologian does sit down to seriously think about a particular work of art as a locus theologicus to see how it might function as revelation, that work of art tends to be what we would call good, um, or what, following David Tracy, we might call a classic, uh, a work of art that has artistic value um, in addition to theological value, a work of art that is made by someone, a work of art, in other words, that has precisely the kind of authority Benjamin was talking about. There are many criteria a work has to meet before it can be called a religious classic, but theological aesthetics has placed a very high value on beauty, as we've heard from several people tonight. And one of the things that makes a work of art beautiful uh, is that it be skillfully, lovingly made, not hastily slapped together or produced on an assembly line. So theological conversation with artwork is almost always with work that is personally and humanly made. In fact, almost all attention to mechanically reproduced objects has taken one of two forms. Either theological denunciations of them as dangerous and often sentimental kitsch, or the deliberately value-free assessments of religious sociologists and historians who look at how people use these objects while refraining from making a theological judgment on their revelatory capacity. Instead of celebrating the advent of this new artistic world order, uh, which is filled with reproduction, and if you think about your bedroom or your living room, um, you will begin to understand just how, uh, how different this is from you know, a couple hundred years ago. Theologians typically lament this. Um, and to give just one example, almost at random, um, several years ago, uh, Joan Chittister wrote that, quote, what may be most missing in this highly technological world of ours is beauty. She illustrated this statement with some examples. Quote, we reproduce the pieta in plastic. We forgo the natural and the real for the gaudy and the pretentious. And she concludes from all of this that, quote, we have lost our way to God. Pretty serious. 
so let me repeat a few phrases then, sort of the structure of her argument. Uh, highly technological is totally opposed to beauty, um, and the natural and the real, that is the authenticity of the marble, natural material, pieta, real, carved by Michelangelo's own hand, uh, is replaced for us by plastic reproductions. In Chittister's view, there is no way to find God through a plastic pieta, or by extension, through uh, the kinds of works that Mary Ellen was looking at, these uh, devotional holy cards. Uh, or to make it personal, um, the pewter statue of St. James or the holy card of Rublev's Trinity that I was looking at when I wrote this talk in my living room. Now, there's a long history behind this discourse about the authentic and the real, and if we had all night, uh, I would go more into it, but we really don't. So I'm going to skip over it um, and simply state that if Benjamin and Schittister are right, uh, then it would be literally impossible to do theology in conversation with mass-produced objects. They're there's no sacred there to have a talk about. Um, but I, of course, because I'm giving this talk, uh, clearly uh, have already decided that they're wrong. And in the time remaining, I want to very briefly suggest uh, four ways in which we might begin to think about mass-produced objects as having some positive theological value. Um, that is, they're not somehow ontologically false or only pale shadows of classic originals. Rather, as humble as they are, Paying attention to them and to the experiences that people are having with them, as opposed to the experiences that they aren't, uh, might enrich the conversation. So, four ways. First, uh, we could relearn an old Christian lesson that while originality and creativity are positive goods, imitation can also be a positive good. Mechanically reproduced objects present us with an opportunity to detach uniqueness, handmadeness, and even artistic skill from art's role as the most tangible link in what some commenters have called a great chain of images stretching all the way back to the divine. Uh, one of the first fully developed statements on Christian art was by the Byzantine theologian John of Damascus, for whom works of art have theological value not based on the skill or the original vision of the artist, but on how well they reflected the saints and the incarnate Christ, who were in turn images of God. So the, the uh, access to the divine kind of descends down this chain of images until you wind up with a physical, actual picture, an, an icon. Um, this was a theological aesthetics which was based on copying, on reproduction. And what mattered was faithful imaging. In fact, John worried that in copying by hand, an artist might introduce mistakes into the work and thus destroy the image's ability to truly reflect the divine. Now, clearly not all mechanically reproduced art, any more than all original art, is going to meet this rather a high test of uh, whether it can reflect the divine. But accepting that it might means accepting that artistic value and theological value are not always the same thing, just as an uncertain grasp of language might not prevent a person from conveying great spiritual insight. Dealing with mechanically reproduced objects a little bit more might help theological aesthetics to avoid aestheticism. Uh, secondly, uh, we might reaffirm through considering mechanically reproduced objects that God is indeed everywhere. Mass-produced objects have the ability to enter everyday life in a way that original art does not. And this was exactly Benjamin's point, that the uniqueness of a work of art rendered it sacred, hidden, and unavailable to ordinary times, places, and people. These things are cheap and readily available. So a poor family might be able to save up to buy a handmade crucifix or an icon, so it's not like you know, people without a lot of money have no access to original art. Or they might have a member talented enough to make one. But if so, would they hang it in the kitchen where it would inevitably be splashed with food? Would they risk carrying it in their pocket or their purse? Would they be willing to freely give it away to family, friends, or strangers who seemed in need of it? It is just because mechanical reproduction has shattered the aura of authenticity, just because these things are cheaply made and not special as objects, uh, that they become available to sacralize vast areas of everyday life. Third, and very much related to, to the uh, two suggestions I've just made, uh, we can see great love manifested, even incarnated, in these objects. A love to which the discourse about the authentic and the real has, sometim has uh, sometimes been blind. When you read the cultural studies literature on the devotional use of mechanically reproduced religious objects, ranging from high quality reproductions of classic works right on down to uh, really pure kitsch, one thing that becomes immediately evident is that these objects are actually better at weaving people together into communities than an original classic can be. 
just because they're so widespread. People tell stories about these objects that have nothing to do with their artistic value and everything to do with their mother or their best friend having given it to them at a time when they needed it, or the way that having a particular picture on their wall and knowing that it hangs on many walls worldwide uh, calls them to a closer relationship with, quote, our faith heritage and the living God. And that's what someone said about a, a reproduction of Leonardo's Last Supper that was on their wall. Finally, uh, I propose that thinking about mechanically reproduced objects as theologians can be an excellent lesson in both humility and humor. Humor has been a really underexplored category in theology, uh, but I agree with Peter Berger that it is an important, uh, what he calls a signal of transcendence. Uh, Berger points out in his book, Redeeming Laughter, that the religious significance of comedy is profound because it points beyond itself to a future in which laughter is not escapist, a refusal to recognize serious problems in the world the way it is now, but rather it becomes a joyful response to a redeemed world. And so when you laugh now, you're kind of looking ahead to this future in which we're not totally messed up. Um, so let me end uh, then by telling a story about a revelation. The paradigmatic story about revelation through art begins with a person encountering a classic that seizes them, that grips them, that produces a sudden enlightenment which they're able to interpret as divinely inspired. And many people that love art could tell this story about themselves. Um, I'm going to tell it tonight, but not about an encounter with Chartres Cathedral or a painting by Botticelli or Rothko. This is a story told to me by a friend who is not a particularly religious woman. I'll call, I'll call her Susan. Uh, no one could accuse her of not understanding the difficulties of this world. Um, in late middle age, she is chronically ill, employed only part-time in a job that aggravates her physical condition, and her husband is often absent. She's not an academic, but she's not uneducated either, and uh, she's you know, pretty culturally literate. She's traveled abroad. She's uh, told me about going to museums. So I think one idea we have about uh, mass-produced devotional objects is that um, people that are educated don't necessarily use them. I don't think that's really uh, true. Um, so I mentioned to her once that I was interested in religious kitsch. When I said that, the most extraordinary thing that happened, her face just absolutely lit up. I, I you could only call it evangelical fervor. Um, I was just totally taken aback, and I, I can't remember her exact words, but I can give you sort of the gist of what she said. So, I collect things like that, pictures and statues of the Madonna and Child. I started buying them a while ago, but then people started giving them to me. I have to tell you, she said, my absolute favorite. It was this really cheap piece of crap, that's a direct quote, uh, my friend gave me after she went to Mexico. It broke after a couple of years. It was this 50 cent thing, but I loved it. It was this little statue, and it had this halo of red lights, and when you plugged it in and turned it on, the lights would blink on and all red, so it would go around. Yeah, yeah, you get the idea. All right. She said, uh, I used to just set it up and laugh and laugh and laugh. It was so crazy. She actually told me this story twice. She, she told it once and then she kind of started over from the beginning and, and went through again. Uh, Susan, again, not a religious woman, would not have used the words revelation or encounter with God to describe how she felt when she was enjoying this totally kitschy object. But the way in which she told the story had all the markers of a person recalling a religious experience. As she talked, she stopped looking at me. Her eyes gazed into the distance and she started to smile. Her shoulders loosened up, she gestured freely, clearly remembering what an amazing feeling it had been to look at this cheap piece of crap, this ludicrous product of an assembly line. And I extrapolate to feel her cramped life opening outward. What moved her to this laughter, this redeeming laughter, I submit, uh, that was, I think, a signal of transcendence, um, was not the excellence of this light-up Madonna, but its status as the opposite of excellence. It couldn't have done it if it had been any less sort of insane. Uh, the ridiculousness, the exuberance of the throwaway. So, ironically, I would suggest, puncturing the aura of the sacred surrounding the original art work of art uh, does not, as Benjamin argued, uh, detach it from the sacred completely. In, in fact, in the contemporary world, it may turn out to be an excellent way to find God. Thank you very much. And, um, I think uh, we're all going to, um, to come up here and have uh, at least a few minutes left over for questions.
Well, I'll start off, Catherine, since you were, but thank you, everyone, for, for uh, four wonderful presentations. Just to start with Catherine, just because it immediately was, uh, stuck in my mind. Um, it seems to me that, can you comment on distinguishing between um, different originals for mechanical reproduction? Because it seems to me that's a big issue here. Uh, the persimmons, for example, uh, or the, that Richard showed. I, I never saw those persimmons before. Um, I want to see the original of that. Uh, the holy cards, not so much. So, so could you could you talk about that a bit? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be very brief, and, and then uh, maybe others uh, have some comments on this issue because it's a huge one, and uh, because of the shortness of the time, I obviously I, I split right over it. Um, I think that uh, the two things um, function differently, and the reason why I didn't uh, I didn't talk about them tonight was because I, I was sort of laser focused on uh, this issue of whether reproduction actually destroys um, access to the sacred. But uh, in works of art that have um, what we would call like original value, uh, like the persimmons or like any other great work of art, um, one of the things that we are doing when we look at them is uh, we're kind of talking the, to the artist like they're feel, like we would talk to a theologian. You know? um, and uh, so there, there's sort of there's a there there in a way that there isn't necessarily with uh, an original that is not a, a good work of art, a classic work of art. Um, and so uh, there's a there's a reference that uh, that drives you to go on and have a theological conversation. I think that uh, for uh, Originals that are not good works of art, or in fact, you know, when you're dealing with photography, there's some question about whether there's an original at all, which is again a whole other huge um, sort of field of aesthetics. Uh, that when you're dealing with an original that, that doesn't sort of inspire you to want to go out and look at it, the objects tend to function much more transparently. Um, the, the there there is not so much um, with the artist, theologian, uh, as with the other things that you wind up associating the object with. Um, like your parents who gave you their, you know, reproduction last supper or, or whatever. Um, or, uh, and I think Mary Ellen could talk about this a lot more than I can, um, the way in which even sort of an inferior picture of the virgin, it doesn't necessarily have much to do with the skill of the work of art because it makes you uh, kind of go to Fatima or, or to Lourdes or wherever it is. So it's leading you kind of through itself so that the, the reproduction image isn't leading you to the work of art, it's leading you, uh, you know, to the religious experience that you associate with. So yes, I mean, you're absolutely right, they're completely different things. I would agree with that, and in case of uh, the apparitional images, the original itself is not the original work of the artist, but it is the original apparitional event, or even the original idea or concept, spiritually speaking, of the Madonna herself. So for devotees, uh, really the quality necessary in the work of art itself is not as important as that referent. And I think that's one thing I, if I had more time, I would emphasize is that that referent among various groups of devotees seems to remain stable, even though the representations on the surface are incredibly diverse. So as long as they're all gesturing toward the same unseen reality and the idea of of sacramental theology, I think, is very much in line with that. Um, that satisfies the, the spiritual need of the devotee. If I was to address this, I, I am going to be the worship of our religious lifestyle. So before I, before I use his words, I, I'm wondering what he could want to say. In theology and the arts, um, he's written two books to talk about theological aesthetics, one more at a graduate level and one at an undergraduate level. And this is the theology and the arts that I read to my classes. He writes, it would seem that, that the aesthetics of Christian worship should not only eschew religious kitsch or sentimentally and superficially pious art and music, it should also contain an element of wariness concerning aesthetic satisfaction, even of a deeply religious kind, that would lead simply to spiritual repose without being joined to a reminder of the anticipatory and world-changing nature of the joy and 
sense just before that in the same book, um, he says that God is transcendently and absolutely beautiful and is to be found in what to the world value is ugly and deformed and unworthy. And um, I think, I don't want to say that he's inconsistent. I think that, I think today what he talked about, he, he sort of showed an opening up to, to seeing the presence of God. He used the phrase, um, if there's a gesture towards some other original source. And I think some of the, um, even someone like John Damascus, someone like Paul Tillich, um, a theologian of symbols, would talk about this idea that symbols point to a greater reality. Um, the manifestation or the representation of that, of that greater reality might vary from culture to culture. I think that there's room for kitsch in Paul Vladislav's theology. <laughs> um, and I don't know whether people fully agree. I think there's an appreciation in the ways that Catherine's talking about. You know, the dimension of a person and an individual object. My sister gave, I, I have students in class, they bring in material objects. What is important? What's the most spiritual thing? And they bring in the most horrible, tackiest little thing. And they come to tears as they explain to me. My sister gave it to me and she died. You know, um, this is a more spiritual thing than any kind of great beauty. So I think the beauty, as he says, it could be ugly and deformed and even, I think, unworthy, which might sort of refer to that, what some might accuse Kitsch of being. You know, did you mention me? Or did I need to read your mom? <laughs> different kinds of values, as, as, I, as I tried to say it now, or just adverted to in the talk, uh, to a certain extent we decide what's going to be beautiful, what's going to be beautiful for us, and the different kinds of beauty, and beauty is an analogous idea. Uh, so something that's ugly aesthetically can nevertheless be beautiful morally, um, something that's, uh, uh, that, that's uh, poor and uh, lacking can be the opportunity for a beautiful act. Um, uh, ignorance is not beautiful, but teaching the ignorant is beautiful. Um, so, so I think that I think there, there, there are just many, many dimensions of it. And I, I've been I've been concentrating, or I was concentrating on, on uh, specifically the aesthetic dimension. But I think one could open up the idea of, of beauty and elegance to all kinds of other dimensions as well. And in, included in that, of course, the, of course, there's an element in which uh, kitsch, in which what's what's considered kitsch, uh, can nevertheless be beautiful because of other reasons than its aesthetic appeal. But that's that's a kind of beauty too. Other questions or comments? Um, actually, I have a couple. If that's all right. Um, First, um, for Mary Ellen and Catherine, um, um, I believe a work of art is an incarnation, and I would take issue with the um, calling the quote by um, John Damascus pertains to icons, and an icon is not a copy. It's um, an icon is not a copy. I believe you call it a copy, but rather is a, man, a sacred manifestation of one's prayer life and one's artistic life. life. So I think it's a stretch to, 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 you know, I wouldn't relegate it to a copy. And I guess um, related to this, to the issue of incarnation is the fact that I feel that both of you, in a way, are defining a work of art by a subjective response of the viewer. But the idea of an incarnation assumes that the work of art itself, it, you know, have, has a religious, um, I mean, if we're talking about theological aesthetics, that the theology is inherent in the work. It's not simply, in other words, you could have a religious experience of a lampshade and I would in no way denigrate that experience, but I might not call the lampshade a sacred work of art. So, do you want to ask your second question? Well, or do you want to okay. the other question is is uh, for uh, Professor Glasso. So maybe I should just. Um, uh, 
I would agree. I mean, obviously, an icon is, is not a copy at all. I would absolutely agree with you. Um, my point was more about um, uh, originality is, is not important in an icon. Um, what's important is faithfulness. And uh, ultimately, what you, as, as in my understanding, you know, what you want an icon to do is to reflect very, very faithfully back up um, what, again, some commenters on John who is in turn an, an image of the, the son is the image of the father, right? And so um, a new perspective is not you know, necessarily a value there. And one of the uh, values in judging whether a work of art, uh, in, the, in, the, in the contemporary world, one of the values in judging you know, whether a work of art is good is whether the artist has some new take, some original vision on the work. Um, and that was more what I was questioning. Instead, should be does this work of art um, faithfully reflect its way back up the chain until you ultimately come to, uh, in some sense, a reflection of God? Um, and so, uh, did that clear that up a little bit more? So it's, it's not a copy at all, but it, but, uh, but the, the, the value is faithfulness. I would also agree with your comment in the question that for Marian devotees, these images are certainly iconic traditional sense and that it's seen as a window into the experience of uh, an appearance of Mary who has a deep spiritual presence to that devotee. And I think with uh, images of the Madonna in particular, this is really interesting because of her role as mediator uh, within the Catholic tradition that she mediates grace in a particular way that is reverenced in the fact that I, I see a play going on that the images themselves as a media also as an icon would mediate that revelation of grace into uh, the life of the devotee, the spiritual life of the devotee. So I, I definitely would see that. And the idea that the sign could, could signify something, but also bring it into the world, also create something. And I think creativity is something I I'm really interested in, in the way that devotees use images, um, that this creative impulse, it, therefore they can turn mass-produced images into icons in the way that they use them, um, because it's the sense of connection and relationality to um, their experience of the Virgin that makes those images come alive. traditional ideas of icon with the iconic. Are there places where they can overlap? Certainly there are places where they diverge greatly. But is there a sense in which the iconic, which captures uh, a moment, a gesture, an idea in a particular way, even the notion of celebrity, you know, if I, when we call a celebrity iconic, I think there's a certain cult of celebrity that might go along with certain personas of the Madonna as she appears in different apparition sites and the, and the representations that come out of that. So I, I am still working out what that interplay is, but I think sometimes it can be really delightful to see uh, what the, the commonality is. But I take your point definitely that there's a difference, and it's the way, I think, um, the way these images are used by the person in their spiritual life that can make some of that difference between what is merely secular 
iconic image versus an icon. And I w want to make a secular analogy here to get back to creativity. Um, the creativity of devotees, I think, is really fascinating when we compare it to what's going on in today's world with technology and the way that especially young people are using the mass-produced images and tools of something like MySpace or Facebook basically to erect a shrine to the cell, that they're creating the shrine that has totally generic components. You know, they use the formatting of, that the page provides them. Everybody has the same layout. It looks the same in a structural sense, but they see these as vehicles of profound self-expression that become sacred to them, in, in essence, to communicating their personality. So that's a little off track, but I think it's the, the intersection of icon and iconic is really I have a question for Professor Vladislav. I come at this uh, from the point of view of an art historian, not a theologian. It's a very general question, and any way you want to handle it would be fine. Why do you think it is that for Catholics, uh, we can't get past the Renaissance or the Baroque as religious art? Uh, clearly, the identification of modernism with secularism has had profound uh, consequences, but uh, as an art historian and who publishes a 19th century religious art, I find there's this tremendous uh, resistance to uh, the meaning of the sacred in anything past Michelangelo or Rubens or Caravaggio. Uh, people would rather have a kitsch or bad, uh, an object in bad taste for these familiar patterns of what a religious image should be. And as I say, it's a very broad question, so any way you want to answer it. Why is it that we can't get past uh, Baroque imagery, the Counter-Reformation imagery, as being religious art? I suppose historically, to a certain extent, it had to do with what happened after the Reformation, um, when, uh, first of all, you had, you had an increasing secularization of art, and the values in art became increasingly secular. I mean, as you know, it, 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 in Counter-Reformation Catholic art theory, um, if you read Robert Bellarmine, for example, there, there is a, a definite preference for what is not aesthetically fine. Is a definite preference for what's plain, for what's rough, for what gets the message across and does not compete with the message by another. 
for, for serving a different master, so to speak. Um, combined with that, you have the increasing secularization of, of art and its values, and the, and the, the value of art as a, as a commodity in the marketplace. Um, and I think that that's, that's part of the reason why the, um, I, I, of course, I, of course, there, there are many, many exceptions to this. I think you, know, you, you had the, 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 the art of Sassoon Peace, as it was called, you know, that, that, that became important art, and, and, and various movements, like Maria Locke, and various places you know, to, to formulate a new kind of, uh, of Catholic religious art. But, but I think that there's, there's a certain comfort with the Renaissance, its pre, pre-Renaissance art, um, because it's so easily associated with the dogmatic tradition and the aesthetics of the modern age are not as easily, you know, I, think that, I think there are mixed values that are not as easily associated. And that's what comes to me offhand, and it, but maybe you, have, maybe you have a much better answer to this than I do. say something quickly before we have the next question uh, on, on this issue of why we never got beyond. Um, I, I think um, I was sort of hoping this kind of question would come up in this session because it gives me a chance to say that uh, although I have just said these very nice things about community building through, you know, a shared um, reference and, and all of these things, which I believe, uh, it's a double-edged sword. And I think we saw in some of the examples that Dominic gave of, of this sort of um, Catholicly kind of uh, build on and defensiveness about um, things like the, uh, the addict Christ or, or the fist Christ, or we had one last year over this totally brilliant life-size chocolate anatomically correct Jesus, which was called My Sweet Lord, and it's sort of an Easter bunny kind of, uh, and so it, 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 was, it was amazing, and, and it provoked this kind of defensive reaction. Because we're not comfortable, you know, Catholics haven't been able to get comfortable with uh, modern devotional art because they're defensive about it, and mass-produced objects sort of give people the uh, ability, among other things, to kind of draw back and to be defensive like that. And so there's a sort of dark side that didn't come up in my talk at all, but which I think is very relevant to the question that you're asking. I would just quickly say, uh, I think we're in a very exciting time with the development of material culture studies, which sort of corresponds to in theology on something that 
speak to the receptivity of students to your idea of the process of looking at art uh, theologically. And Dominic teaches a popular class called Faith in the Arts, and, it, and he teaches it in a regular, a traditional semester-long format, and also, uh, also teaches it as a travel course to Italy. And I'm wondering if the students react differently to that process of looking at art um, on site versus looking at reproductions in the class. process of art making as a spiritual practice, regardless of whether it may produce an image or not, but that somehow the finished product is an embodiment of that process. Um, for, for example, it might be uh, regarded as a form of meditation. Um, how would that kind of artwork fit into a a theological context. Well, I, I would say that this this would be another kind of criterion for what what constitutes sacred art. You know, I talk about the you know, these ambiguous cases, which are which look like secular art, but uh, but which in fact have hidden allegories in them. A another kind of case would be people like. Say even Kandinsky, uh, you know, who, who thought that abstract art was the spiritual kind of art precisely because it was non-representational. I thought that simply by colors you could create uh, spiritual experiences. People like Mondrian who were, who were you know, inspired by theosophy, uh, so that for them, subjectively, what they were doing was a kind of a sacred procedure. Some, something like, and it's not, it's not coincidental that Kandinsky was Russian, you know, something like what the icon maker uh, does. But of course, that doesn't guarantee that the viewer of it is going to see it as, uh, uh, as a sacred piece. It seems to me you get into that ambiguity again. It might still function as being sacred for a different reason, for one of the many different reasons uh, why something might uh, connect with the holy or with the good um, you know, the, the, as, a, as a kind of parable of some sort. But unless we know the intention of the um, of the artist, you know, I mean, if, if I look at most Mondrians, they, they're not particularly sacred to me. I mean, they, they may have been to him, or most Kandinsky's. I, if I look at it, I, I don't get any spiritual message for it. But I know that he meant them to be spiritual. So I think there's a, there's a there's an ambiguity about it. 